Well, thank you so much. Welcome uh, all my fellow Lincoln obsessives, as Spielberg likes to call us, and I take that on as a good badge. I, we already have a marketing plan when the casino comes in a block from the shop. One block, you can count it. And so, uh, trade in your Franklins for a Lincoln. <laughs> could work, could work. All right, well, I was 24 in 1968, so uh, I was a child of the 60s. And back then, the fabulous furry freak brothers had a poster out that said, dope will get you through times of no money better than money will get you through times of no dope. Well, you know, neither here nor there, but at the same time, I like the philosophy, and I've upgraded it, especially for today. Uh, and so I'm now saying that artifacts will get you through times of no money better than money will get you through times of no artifacts. So that's a dealer, of course, in my philosophy. Uh, and I, you know, I hope my remarks here today will, will uh, get you on my side on that. Now, I started out, my first artifact that I really got <laughs> crazy about was this wonderful tablet in the British Museum. This is the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Noah story for the Sumerians, the flood story. And I must have sat in front of that for an hour, just staring, and, and the elderliness of that. And so that's the first artifact that really got to my heart. When I got to the shop, the first artifact that I ever purchased, and my wife said, why did you do that? What are you going to do with that? was one of these commemorative water pictures for Elmer Ellsworth. It wasn't exactly this one, but one almost exactly like this. And uh, it, it was the first time that an artifact spoke to me, or I had to figure out how the artifact was, was speaking to me, uh, and what it was and why. It's interesting that soon after I got to the shop, uh, a middle class, a middle aged, a uh, black man was coming in, and he was interested in Franklin Roosevelt. And it was about the second, third time that he came in, I realized he could not read. But he wanted to surround himself with his hero, with the artifacts that will remind him of his hero. And those are the books that he was getting. Now, you know you're a true collector, by the way, uh, when you begin thinking about the things you should have purchased, and didn't, instead of more about the things that you now have in your own collection. Well, with humanities not being spoken of well today, these days in schools, they're not being taught very well, not universally, but not enough, uh, it's up to us, groups such as ours, to speak about these to others, to depart, uh, give our knowledge to especially younger people. I know that it's helping that the newsrooms are becoming the new school rooms with all of these talking heads that are there, like Doris Kearns Goodwin, thankfully, and John Meacham and others, and they're imparting history at a time when people aren't really watching it, so it's fed to them, and so that certainly helps. But it's organizations like these that are steeped in knowledge that uh, can help pass on to the next generation, the past. Now, not all artifacts belong in institutions. I'm sorry, Michelle. <laughs> but uh, it's because that collectors, and there are many of them out here, have a unique place and leak role. And they're embedded in their communities. And they're being, with the, being the custodians of physical artifacts they can exhibit them in local libraries, schools, and other institutions around them and impart what they have through those artifacts. So embedded in their communities, they are on the front lines of keeping the stories and lessons of the past alive. Now Malcolm Forbes had told his kids, sell it all off. And in five large, 
uh, catalogs that Sotheby's produced, he sold off most of his collection back to the collecting world. He said the next generation needs these to be able to connect, and the artifacts do that. Even though donations are important, and especially to all museums, I, the collections also have to have a voice. And they have to have an advocate themselves, besides you and me who want to do something with them or get money from them. What does the collection need? What's best for that? And so I usually impart on collectors who are going to donate, leave a few things out. Put it back in the marketplace. Any way you're going to do it, whether it's going to be a, well, whatever is best to get the best money for you, but also to get back to the next generation of collectors. So they have something. Um, is, um, Gilder Lehrman collection is spectacular, but how much material, even though it's good for research, is just now off the market. So that's something to think about. Now, artifacts are man-made uh, for a particular purpose uh, and for human needs and desires. And they show what the past eras valued, being memory and meaning to life, and they're testimonials of the past and eyewitnesses to the past. But artifacts, I find, like, like to play games. They come into me and they ask me, why do I exist? And so, tag, I'm it, and I've got to then decide, just like the rest of you when you get a collection there, or a, a piece, why does it exist? What does it mean? Why, do, why should I have it? Why should I tell others about it? Because collecting is an expression, truly, of intellectual curiosity. Now, artifact power, and that's what we're supposed to be talking about a bit today. And Ralph Newman, who began the shop, <clears throat> He used to say that I shook the hand of the man who shook the hand of the man who shook the hand of Abraham Lincoln. And that's a pretty direct chain. Yet an artifact is even more direct and more personal. That's mainly because many times, especially with, with manuscripts uh, and sometimes books, they were in the hand of the person that you're collecting. That, how, you can't get more direct than that. Some of you have been in the Smithsonian, perhaps, and had the real privilege of holding in your one's hand the coffee cup that Elizabeth Keckley kept after Lincoln went off to Ford's. And she kept it, unfortunately, uh, washed it, I guess, all that DNA gone. But <laughs> to, to hold just maybe the, one of the last objects that Lincoln held, uh, how direct can you get than that? Now, Lincoln was involved in, as all of you know, in many aspects of human activity. And their artifacts touch all of those disciplines and activities in which humans were involved. And Lincolniana offers one of the world's richest areas of collecting because of the many intersects of that that occur through the Lincoln story. I just noticed that I forgot to show you the next slide because this is something that Lincoln held in his hand. In fact, this is the only time he misspelled his name. <laughs> the papers have told me that they've not seen another. It became Lincoln, and he crossed it out and did it again until he got it right. But he's, he was involved in politics, the law, logic, war, humor, sports, use of language, photography, technology, commerce, mourning culture and more, and each of these have artifacts associated with them. Books, autographs, manuscripts, letters, jewelry, weaponry, prints, oil paintings, ephemera, photographs, medals, coins, and even just stuff. So there's so much in the Lincoln world that's out there. And for us to be able to enjoy and understand, and even if we can't read, have something on the shelf that reminds us of the man that we admire. Now, I've also found that I've always asked about provenance, and artifacts need provenance. And I found that many do not have it. There's no clean line of provenance. So that's why an artifact has to be studied, researched, and understand why it exists and why it is there, 
and why it might have gone to uh, the uh, next person. Now, here is one. Some have direct, direct connections to whoever had it. This is one of the three tables, three, that were in Appomattox Courthouse. Most of us know of two, but uh, one is in the Chicago Historical History Museum, and that came through General Ord. He bought that for 40 bucks. And then General Sheridan bought the mate to this table for 20 bucks, allegedly throwing 20 bucks onto the floor. Here, we're taking this. Gave it to Custer, who was seen by many having this table on his back as he rode off from mathematics. And uh, Elizabeth, after the massacre, donated it to the Smithsonian. But Thomas Wells, Gideon Wells' son, was a captain on Ord's staff. And he got this table. And his grandson kept a fish tank on it. But uh, nonetheless, that had a direct line to where it came from in mathematics and why we know it is correct. Now, some <clears throat> don't have any provenance. Now, I'm going to mention uh, someone who the previous uh, speaker did not mention. But Mr. Booth the, may have had this because that's what the oral history was from the family I, I got it from. Now, I looked at it, and I looked at all the photographs I could see and find of Booth, nothing. He was never wearing that. But then it's Coral, and Coral was large in the 1850s into the 60s, a little bit, when it fell out of favor. But Mary Lincoln kept on with uh, Coral, loved Coral. But it's a t the time is correct. And I looked at it and say, this is a cravat pin. You keep your cravat together with this pin. Well, who's going to put this on their cravat? What, a lawyer or an or a educator or a pharmacist or a preacher? No. How about a thespian? How about a Shakespearean who would wear something like this kind of proudly? When I was in Gramercy Park once to the Players Club and went in there on the second floor, this was Edmund, uh, Edwin Booth's home, and they kept much of it as it was back then, especially his room. And on the second floor, there's a large case, glass case, of all the various bodkins he used for various roles. Because the Shakespearean uses this knife for Richard II, but this other knife for Hamlet, and this other one for Otello. That's how important the knife is to a Shakespearean. So I can't put another zero onto it, which I'd like. <laughs> but. Um, it's, it's, it, I think it was most likely Booth's, but I can't prove it. So that's how that goes. But then there, again, there are some that are just outright forgeries. Now here is John Hay, two weeks after the assassination, and he's writing to a woman who wrote to him asking for something from Lincoln. And, what did he, and this came out of an album of many uh, autographs that this woman had collected. This is the front page on the left, hey, and the right, this, this wonderful CDV, but I looked at that, mm, I wasn't sure about that, so I went down to the papers and did some work down there, and we're all positive this is John Hay. It's in my forgery collection. I have over 74 Lincoln forgeries now that I've taken off the market, hopefully sometime to get into some museum, library, so it'll be off the market, can be researched. But that is uh, hay, and it really pissed me off. That's <laughs> two weeks after the assassination, he should be in deep mourning, and he's forging Lincoln's signature. Now, by the way, this is an interesting photograph as well, now that I'm on this. I don't know if you can really see right here but I will show you what is right there. Right there. And on the carte de visite, over and over and over, I see this little white spot over years. What in God's name was that? And finally, I was able to get a hold of the glass plate, which is the Brown University, and blow it up. And it turns out to be a fly. And there are his wings, and that's his body right there. It was in Gardner's studio. It was August, and 
windows were open and he had to sit still and there it is. So I used to market that, that CDV as C. Lincoln's Fly. <laughs> it worked, it worked. So, now Hay also, I should mention, the endorsements that he produced, and he produced numbers of them secretarially for Lincoln, especially from December of 64 to Lincoln's death. And he, I call them secretarials, and that's what they are, they're not really forgeries, but he didn't indicate that. He didn't put parentheses with an SGD next to it, saying that this is not Lincoln. And I see them come up at, at catalogs, and I see it, them at auctions, and they're hay. Uh, and, and also, um, the carte de visite came up signed by Lincoln, allegedly. Uh, two of them came up, one signed by him positively, and another one, this was at Heritage about six, seven years ago. And the one, of the, uh, one of them had on the back, hay authenticating the signature. Uh, I took a step back and said, and that went for $170,000. And the other one, right after that, went for $72,000, which is where it, the first one should have gone. But the first one, I'm not sure, actually was uh, Lincoln. Anything Hay gets close to, I worry about now. <laughs> so, so Dennis Hanks and John Hay, be careful. Now, I've found personally that uh, it's advantageous to be in commerce and deal in artifacts, historical artifacts, because I look at them from a commercial or business point of view from when they were made in the first place. Business practices, the needs, the expectations. It's an ad advantageous to look at it through that and how perhaps something was produced and why. Now this is a kind of simplistic one, but this is an oil painting I have in the shop now, and I've had this since the early 90s, and I just kind of love it, so I keep it. Uh, I have to find a home for it, though. I mean, it really yeah. does. It's been in, I've gotten to an age, you know, where is it going to go? Uh, and it's been in Illinois. This was produced by Charles Merck, who worked for Alexander Hessler. Now, Hessler was actually a, um, a portrait artist. That's what he really was. When photography came up, he started to use that new technology to take a photograph of a client, and then they could leave. And then they would use that to produce the oil painting of. So the Republicans, of course, needed, as you all know, in June of 60, uh, they needed to clean up Lincoln. So Hester went down. Now, this was produced, and it's hard to see, perhaps, but right here, it's signed by Merck. Uh, in Chicago, C. Merck, and then it says 7 July 1860. One month after the photograph was taken that this is based upon, uh, that, uh, and, and every, every oil painting from life, they used a photograph as well. But from life means that the author, the artist, saw, viewed Lincoln up close, saw the eye color, the tone of the, of the skin. So, and I knew from a previous oil that I'd had from life out of Springfield that these were his eyes, and I knew that Merck had to have been down there and seen it, it had to have been from life. Just because Hessler went down there with three of his kids, he went down there with cameras and glass plates and chemicals, he needed someone, and they had already decided to put this up in Hessler's studio which is where it went. Many, Brady did this, you know, he had a huge wall of all the people that he had photographed and uh, just to show next clients, hey, sit in this chair, Abraham Lincoln sat there. So uh, that's, that's what they do. This went into actually the sanitary fair in Chicago and uh, sold for $64 and change and then went to Lincoln Illinois, that went into, uh, I think it was Alton, where Jim Hickey saw it first. And then, uh, thankfully, I had a chance to get it, and, and I did. But again, business practices showed me that this had to have been something that Merck went down there for, because there's no indication of that anywhere else. But he had to have been there. 
So being in the artifact, by the way, there are no notes. I was, when I first came into the business, I was told, yeah, all these artists, they would go see Lincoln and they take notes on all the things that I said, skin color, etc. There's not one note that I've ever found. If anyone knows of any artist notes, I'd love to see them. I've never seen them. But of course, the artistic sensibilities, they remember those things. And being in the business of artifacts, historical artifacts, has placed me at the nexus of commerce, academia, librarians, museum, curators, collectors, and it's a community that needs to stay tight and connected if we're going to help the next generations. Now, we usually take, I know I do, uh, take items away from families. And early on, I learned that uh, at 18 East Chestnut in 72 or 73, when a young man walked in with an, inscri with an inscribed Kennedy photograph, John Kennedy, to Jake Arvey, the Democratic boss who helped make FDR president, helped make Kennedy president, and he was going to sell this to me. I said, oh my gosh, this is, this is your, you know, your grandfather. Who, with, with Kennedy, and you're going to sell this to me and get it out of the family. Well, I mean, I bought it. He was very, <laughs> you know, so I have to keep my doors open. And, but I, it really impressed me. But, but the problem is that I've never been able to return a piece to a family until fairly recently. And all of a sudden, this piece came to me. And this is an interesting guy, Peter Toltevel. Some of you may know that name. But Toltevel, here's on the back of it, and here he's being discharged from the Marine Corps Band. He was in the Marine Corps Band, and you know, many of you know Wilmer McLean. He was in Bull Run, the beginning of the Civil War, and he said, oh my gosh, it's on my farm, let me get out. And he went west, and the war followed him to Appomattox, where the surrender took place in his parlor. So he saw the parentheses of the war. Well, Peter Tartival, Taltival, excuse me, saw the parentheses of Lincoln's presidency because he was playing at the first inauguration of, in the Marine Band. Then he got discharged. And then he went out and purchased a saloon. And so happened that saloon was next door to Ford's Theater. So John Wilkes Booth, sorry, um, came in and Paltival served him his last two drinks, a glass of whiskey and a glass of water. And then he walked out next door and did the deed. Paltival was at the parentheses of Lincoln's presidency. So I found that and I sold it to a guy and then all of a sudden, about a year and a half later, I met a new client. Long story short, turned out to be a Taltival. It wasn't his name now, but he was a descendant. And I told him of this, and he said, oh my gosh, if you could ever. Well, the guy that I sold it to passed, and the daughter sold it back to me, and I sold it back to the family. So now Taltival is back in the family. And that's a real thrill to be able to give it back to a family. Now, James Randall, as we all know, uh, had that famous pamphlet, Has the Lincoln Theme Been Exhausted? And uh, the continuing abundancy, abundance, I should say, of, of books, etc., shows that no, <laughs> it's not yeah. been exhausted. And, but I began to wonder about artifacts. Has, has the artifact field been exhausted? I saw the same things over and over. I didn't really see many new things. But all of a sudden, I, could, I should say, really in the next last 10, 12 years, I found many things that have come through that are totally new that maybe are not a sixth Gettysburg Address, but nonetheless have interesting value. And this, this wonderful oil painting by Frederick Augustus Wendreth, a photographer in Philadelphia. And he went down to Washington and took a photograph of Lincoln to be able then to produce an oil painting, went back and produced the oil painting and put that up, like we talked about others, putting these up in their, in their studios. But 
this is what, on the left, you'll see the CDV, that's what we all knew. But all of a sudden, this showed up, and I realized there's a missing photograph. And that is the missing photograph in oil. With his hands, just terrific to see those hands. And so there's, there's an oil painting that, ta that talks to me about something missing we may never see now, but there it is, a new photograph that should be in the next Ostendorf book. Now, this next piece is one that I've been proselytizing for, especially to the papers of Abraham Lincoln. And so this is where the internal evidence shows me that I think this is actually Lincoln. All of this is certainly Lincoln. We all agree. And a woman came in and said she needed a Catholic chaplain uh, in a hospital, needed more, uh, more Catholic chaplains. And Lincoln wrote this out, gave it to her, go to the, and, and get it done. And he didn't really need to sign this. He didn't always sign these sorts of, of letters and notes. But I think that she wanted him to sign and stayed maybe for this reason as well. The date, September 22nd of 1862. That's the Emancipation Proclamation, preliminary. He signed it that day. Now, I did some science, scientific uh, testing of this in a lab here in Chicago. And this ink is different than this ink, but very close to it. There were four iron gall solutions in those days. And so it wasn't exact. It was a little bit like this. And, it's, and I, the ink is of the day. Now, the thing is here, a. B. Lincoln. A. B. Lincoln. Why did he do that? I, asked, I talked with the papers about it. We all agreed it wasn't Nicolay. He couldn't do that. John Hay was better than that. I've already shown you that. <laughs> it's not a forger. They, they thought so, and I thought so, too. How is a forger going to get that in an ink right then like that, too? So I think that he came out of the, the preliminary emancipation signing in the cabinet room, she was there, and she put this in front of him and said, I want you to sign this. And so at a different desk, different ink, he did that, but he was, you know, what have I just done? And he started out another Abraham and stopped and said, oh, no, I don't need to do that. And then signed the rest of his name a little strangely, too. By the way, interestingly, when I went into this even further, this O, you see how his, his hand stopped for a little, just a second, and a little bit more ink flowed onto the paper. So that is also what happened on the Emancipation Proclamation, the exact same place that he again stopped a little bit, slowed down, and then continued on. So I'm, I believe that that's an, a Lincoln signature. Springfield is not saying yes to me yet, but I'm pushing for this to get into the canon of that. And so another piece that I've, I had recently uh, <clears throat> was this, that internal evidence was fascinating with it. This is a folk art that actually was collected by uh, Big Jim Thompson. This was his. And I got this from the First Lady uh, recently to sell for the estate. And it's really emancipation. You can't see it, but it is. It's emancipation here. And it's just beautifully wrought. And uh, it's hard to see some of this. I know the, the leaves, et cetera. Down here is a log cabin, some split rails, and then the White House with the greenhouse still there. And in front, there's a, a specific uh, fountain with a specific way the, the water came out. So I knew nothing about it. Thompson, an, an artifact guy, kept no records. Zip. So I urge you to keep records. And I, so when was this done? The, if you got it at an auction, the auction house is gone. All the records are gone, so I can't find them to say, where did you get this? So I, I tried to date it at least. So there was a Jefferson statue in front of the executive mansion right where that, that fountain is. They changed it in 1871. 
Chicago Fire, by the way, as you know. Uh, so that's my beginning. Then I, the greenhouse was still there, which means that it, had, it could go all the way up to 1904 when Teddy Roosevelt made the, that the West Wing, took it down, made it the West Wing. So those, that's my parameters. But then when I look up here, at this eagle, and in his beak and claws is the snake of secession. And when the 80s came, as most of you know, that was reconciliation. No one is going to put secession, all oh, the damn Confederate secessionists, and the snake. So I think this is the 1870s at least. And who did this? Don't know, but it's just a gorgeous piece. Almost seven feet high and four feet wide. Well, that's how you look at internal evidence to try to figure something out about an artifact. Now, as I said, new discoveries. How am I doing on time here? Uh, just a few more minutes. A few more minutes. So I'm going to go through this kind of quickly. Just show some, new, some of these new things that have come up. This land grant. Land grants were stopped. The president stopped signing land grants in Jackson's, Andrew Jackson's second term. He got his his uh, adopted son, Jackson Jr., to start in the land office signing for him. Van Buren did the same. And you can see that the land grant has this by crossed out, secretary crossed out, and Stoddard for Lincoln was the one who would have signed for Lincoln right there, and then by, and he would have put his name. Here's the land office uh, recorder. Lincoln did this himself. January 2nd, am I right there, of 63? So the day after emancipation, he was giving land, land as a gift to Senator King, who had, as a Democrat, helped him in April of 64 rid the District of Columbia of the slaves. And he, was, he wanted to do this himself, and I bet King was right there in the, in the executive mansion, the only one that Lincoln ever signed. I never thought I'd see that. Uh, and it, it really took me by surprise. Another piece that uh, is interesting that I've seen a few of these, but this is his own uh, comic book, and this is Jack, Abraham Jack Lincoln. And on the inside, I wish I had had that here, he wrote out uh, A. Lincoln, and you know, he was a forger uh, of his grandfather. He's, he forged Lincoln's uh, hand, his signature. And okay, I, especially me, uh, as many of you would know, I don't want to see any young person perish. But boy, if he had lived, <laughs> it would have made my life miserable. <laughs> All right, so that's, that's that. Uh, I'm not going to have time for this one. Uh, the abolitionists were trying to make him, uh, make him one of theirs. I don't know if you can see Lincoln right in here. Uh, he didn't, he didn't want to be in this national convention on their board, but it was too late. They put him in. This, by the way, this booklet uh, was getting monies for an abolitionist house in Kansas. Don't know exactly where, but Supposedly, this is from Springfield, but none of these people are from Springfield, so I'm not sure how that really worked. Um, interestingly, that uh, an artifact can also be seen, if, if an artifact really is a three-dimensional piece, Michelle and I have been talking about that, can a piece of paper, a letter, be an artifact? Is this, uh, this is E.P. Alexander, uh, uh, Lee's chief of artillery and he's writing after the war uh, this letter about what he did at Appomattox how he saw Lee well this is actually uh, just like Wondereth that it shows a photograph that's gone this is an artifact that he shows right there no one has ever known it until I saw this that Longstreet excuse me uh, Alexander built a readout three-sided area for Lee to sit in and be comfortable in until Grant asked him to come to, to uh, sign the, the surrender. So that's the only no, known 
sketch, I guess I would say, of an artifact. Now this is one that, uh, I've, four of these have come up, I've handled all four because I just needed to and wanted to and obsessed with it. And this was made in Cuba by a Paris firm, Crespus and Barbon, and it's a memorial fan. And uh, you can see Lincoln here with all these cherubs. And on the other side is Booth planning the deed, carrying it out, getting away, shot in the farm, all these devils around him. The interesting, two interesting things about this. First of all, all four of those fans were made of aluminum, which had just been discovered in 59. And that was a very precious alloy, for heaven's sakes. I don't know how much it cost, but uh, I have one right now that was actually shown in Paris in 1867 at the Paris World's Fair. This one was made for the Central American market, for the defense of the woman. And that's why there's a little button here, and you press it up, and this stiletto comes out. <laughs> and below it, right here, really, on the other side, is a hinged piece that opens up, and you could put poison in there, in case you have to quickly put it into someone's drink when they weren't looking, you know? So Central America, probably still useful today. <laughs> well, this gets too much. I thought, it would, I, thought I actually would... I had Tubman in front, but it's a different Tubman. This is a great piece. Another time I'll talk about that. I don't have the time here and now. Uh, but nonetheless, um, let's see what else I was going to show. Uh, just at the end, this was in the wigwam. This is an artifact that came out of the wigwam, and someone on the back of a store card was putting in each, each of the votes that finally elected Lincoln. So that was one of the main, main uh, artifacts that ever came out of there and uh, just showed up one day. And this I just needed to show because of, here's the animal himself. This is the cleaning mask. Many of you know that the life mask was uh, found by Richard Gilder and uh, he got St. Gaudens, Augusta St. Gaudens, to take that and produce, there were 33 subscribers to get monies to buy the original that's now in the Smithsonian. And St. Gaudens gave each of the subscribers a pair of hands and a life mask taken from the original. And this was the cleaning mask out of the uh, one that he did. After he made the first mold off the original mask, then he cleaned it with this. And I think this is as close as you're ever going to get to physically seeing three dimensions of that man. So thank you very much for being here today and thinking about artifacts with all of us. Thank you. Do we have time for any? Uh, why don't you take one or two questions? All right. Okay. Dan, would you share your thoughts about the provenance of the Lincoln hat at the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, some time has gone by now. Is, is, is the dust settled or not? It better settle. Uh, you know, I, I guess bottom line is if it walked into my shop, I would not buy it. I would not handle it. Mainly because I was, I knew Jim Hickey well. I knew Ralph Newman well. I knew how he got that hat. And they didn't think it was that hat. All right, I'll come open about this then. That how that became the Lincoln hat is that the Freedom Train in 1974 and they were going and if the Freedom Train was one that was going to go around the country for two years with artifacts on it from uh, that would show Lincoln and the, and the world really, uh, excuse me, the, the nation, the nation's history. And it went around for two, two years. And they went to the Smithsonian and said, can we borrow Lincoln's hat and put it on the train? They said, no, you're gonna, t <laughs> you're gonna take a two years of an iconic piece like that out, out there, forget it. They heard about Jim Hickey's hat. And Jim said, sure. Came back the Lincoln hat. And it should, and I don't really wanna say more, uh, but it, it should not have been sold and it should not have been sold to the, 
to Springfield, and they should have done better work on that hat. And there's just no way that that was Lincoln's hat. So that's me. Uh, does anyone have a controversial question to ask? Or, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, a few years ago, uh, the shop, uh, your shop put up for sale a little note that Lincoln wrote, I believe, in February 1864, in which he requested the presence in his office of Judson Kilpatrick. Yeah. And your note, what the, the note from your bookstore was, is this what got Lincoln killed? Yeah, see Lincoln's fly. I mean, really. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, could be. Why not? You know, Jeff Davis found that, you know, they found that note that, you know, in Dahlgren that he, that they were supposed to maybe capture, kill, cabinet, Jeff Davis. Well, two can play at that game. So, yeah, I, I kind of thought it's, Maybe stretching it a little bit, but it's in the possibility that Kilpatrick coming to him with his scheme, uh, that started the assassination. Yeah, could be. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. That was fun. Thank you.